Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all back to uh, our 10th annual Sacred Trust History Talks and Book Signings presented by the Gettysburg Foundation and Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Brooke Diaz and I'm with the Gettysburg Foundation. The foundation is the nonprofit partner to the National Park Service here at Gettysburg. And over the years, as we've presented Sacred Trust, we've had the great pleasure of hosting renowned Civil War authors, uh, historians, National Park Service rangers, and uh, licensed battlefield guides so that they can share their perspectives on the Civil War and the Battle of Gettysburg with you. And this year, we have added a new component, which is very exciting. Uh, we're live streaming all of our Sacred Trust talks to our website, gettysburgfoundation.org backslash sacred trust. So if any of you have friends or family who aren't able to make it out today or in the next couple of days, please guide them to that website and uh, they'll be able to enjoy with you. Now coming up next, Michael C.C. C. Adams will be sharing his presentation on 1864 to the edge of sanity. And many, many a man has gone crazy. Adams will explore the full extent of human cost the cruelty, the suffering, and loss. In his book, Living Hell, he provides a framework for the participants themselves to tell the story of war. Adams grew up in England, steeped in, his, in stories of Robin Hood, Ivanhoe, and Sherwood Forest. Having an early interest in America, in 1972, he joined the faculty at Northern Kentucky State. As the school evolved into Northern Kentucky University, Adams rose in faculty rank to Regents Professor. Author of numerous articles and papers, he's published five books on military history. His book, Our Masters, the Rebels, won the Jefferson Davis Prize and the Museum of the Confederacy in Rich, uh, from the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond, Virginia. In 2003, Adams resigned from the full-time teaching retaining his title of Regents Professor of History Emeritus. Please give a warm welcome to Michael C.C. Adams. Thank you. I am honored to be here. It was a dream of mine as a kid in England to visit Gettysburg, and I think this is my fifth trip, and I've spoken three times, so it's been lovely for me. In fact, I think I own a brick-sized bit of Gettysburg when in the 60s they were trying to stop commercialization. I think I, I bought a bit when I was living in England. Anyway, um, I've just written a book called Living Hell, The Dark Side of the Civil War. Um, and what I tried to do in it is, is just to remind us, this is the book, um, that the war was very hard. Uh, many books deal with this in one way or another, but I tried to pull together as much as I could on the human cost of the war and to do it through the voices of the participants. We often say that the Victorians were closed-mouthed about everything. Uh, they really were not. If you read their memoirs, diaries, letters, they were very candid about what was happening to them. Uh, w one example of that that really struck me, jo Joseph Crowell of the 13th New Jersey was in line waiting to go into action at Chancellorsville in May of 1863. And he was watching a staff officer talking to the colonel of the regiment, uh, both on horse. And suddenly that staff officer lacked half a face. And Crowell, uh, not able to uh, sustain that Victorian masculine pose of indifference, screamed. And wh what had happened was a piece of shrapnel uh, traveling so fast you couldn't see it, uh, and with the noise you couldn't hear it, it simply sliced that part of the staff officer's face off. And uh, this is in Crowell's memoir, printed memoir. And then a little later, while they're still waiting to go in, 
He's watching a Union battery exchanging fire, counter battery fire, with a rebel battery. And unfortunately for the Union cannoneers, a rebel shell landed right on a caisson, an ammunition uh, wagon, blowing it sky high along with a number of gunners. And one came down, uh, he had lost his ears, eyes, nose, all of his skin was burnt to a crisp, his fingers were gone, and Crowell says, this thing, he calls this man a thing, begged me to kill him. So there's so much about uh, the, the hardship of this war generation that I thought it would not be a bad idea uh, to, to simply bring all this together just to remind us of how hard it was. And I think if you do understand how hard it was, you respect these people all the more for what they went through. Uh, it, it wasn't much of a picnic. They thought it would be a ball run, but it was not a picnic for anyone involved. And I, I, I take the reader through the war on a kind of journey a road, uh, using Stephen Crane's metaphor of the road from the red badge of courage crawling with wounded. I take us in a logical sequence, I hope, through uh, the boys going to camp, what they experience there, camp diseases, getting into trouble, doing naughty things that soldiers always do, uh, being disciplined for it, being crucified on a case on wheel uh, until you're nearly dead for drunkenness, that sort of thing. And then on the march, moving cities, uh, surrounded by flies, lacking water, dirty, uh, on the march. And then, of course, close action combat, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And the plight of civilians, uh, grief throughout the nation as the casualties piled. And if you lived in the South, whatever your ethnic group, you experienced invasion, something most of us are not used to. But the South knew invasion in a very real and serious way. And it created problems for everyone. Why then would it be especially difficult by 1864? It is a hard war in many ways from the beginning. But by 1864, um, the sky has really darkened. It's a hard war. And I, the piece on my little blurb today is from Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Many of you will know he served as an infantry officer before uh, going on to a distinguished ca career as a Supreme Court Justice. But he was an infantry officer in the 1864 Virginia campaigns, and this is what he said. Many a man has gone crazy since this campaign began from the terrible pressure on mind and body, and he contemplated resigning his commission because he felt absolutely shattered, but he hung on till his term expired. Why would this be? Um, let's start by saying 19th century combat, mid-19th century combat, was carnage incarnate. The concept of the nation had developed in the 19th century to where there was in European countries, in the US, a felt universal obligation to bear arms in an emergency. You served in the local militia, for example. And this meant that armies, unlike the small professional armies of the 18th century, you remember in the Revolutionary War, the British had to hire German mercenaries to even be able to get their army up to fighting strength. 19th century armies were very big. And you could put a large number of men in the field because of transport. We had the steamboat, the railroad, metal-ized road surfaces. Uh, 
You could clothe them, equip them, feed them, uh, desiccated, or as the soldiers put it, desecrated uh, supplies, canned goods, whatever. And so you can put all these men in the field and you can kill them efficiently. The rifled musket may look antique to us, but it's extremely efficient weapon compared to what had come before. Much superior artillery. And so what you have is enormous destruction. Uh, you might take Solferino, a battle fought in Europe on the 24th of June, 1859. The Australians who were on, Austrians, sorry, who were on one side, the Austrians lost in a day 14,000 killed and wounded. The French-Italian forces on the other side lost 15,000. And this was so shocking that it led to the creation of the International uh, Red Cross. Civil war casualty rates are equally horrific. Uh, at Shiloh in April of 1862, 10,000 on each side. Antietam, uh, September of 1862, combined losses of 22,700. It, it's hard for us to actually come to grips with this. We're not used to these kinds of losses. Regiments went into battle and might come out with only 40 to 50 percent of their effective still standing. And uh, it, it is not surprising that a number of them, quite a number of them, could not stand this. And I just pause for a moment to talk about uh, the mini ball. You may have bought one, or you're probably familiar with them, I don't know. Uh, a mini ball is a conical lead bullet. I think they're selling them here for three bucks, the originals. Uh, it's a conical red bullet, and you'll notice at the base, it usually has three concentric rings on the outside. And the base itself is hollow. And for a long time, people have been trying to figure out a problem. Um, you wanted a rifle because its trajectory gave it speed and range and accuracy. But you wanted it fast loading. And that had been the smooth bore. But smooth bores were inaccurate. Over about 70 yards, good night. You weren't going to hit much of anything. The mini ball's beauty is that it drops down the barrel like a smooth bore. It doesn't have to be hammered down the way old rifle balls had to be hammered down. Drops down the barrel like a smooth bore. But when it's fired, the gases go into that hole in the base pushing those, con those concentric circles into the rifling. So it goes in as a smooth bore, comes out as a rifle bullet. And that's brilliant. It's fast firing. It's really effective. The problem is this. A mini ball, soft lead, spreading as it's fired, cannot hold up on contact. A modern steel uh, or whatever bullet of, say, 0.33 caliber can go right through you. A 0.578 or 0.58 mini ball of soft lead tends to stay in the body, particularly if it hits, say, bone. It just explodes it, fractures the bone, shatters it, and it's coming out about that size. If it hits you and it can't go through, it will what I call travel. My editor said, what do you mean, travel? Well, what I mean is a mini ball might hit you here, rattle around your mouth, take all your teeth out, go down your throat, and come out your left nipple. Uh, horrible wounds, horrible wounds. Tracking across your face, take out both eyes, pumping blood. And. This was not intentional, but it was devastating. That is why surgeons took limbs off. It's not that they were butchers. It simply couldn't do anything else with the technology they had. And a good surgeon could take off a limb in about a minute and a half. So that image from Gone with the Wind of sawing away, please don't cut, please don't cut, it's really a myth. But it, it was horrifying. 
and making matters worse, the officers, I feel, didn't adapt well. They used formations that were appropriate to an earlier age with a smooth bore musket where you marched up until literally you were looking into the whites of the enemy's eyes and then you open fire. Well, with the mini ball that has extended the effective range from 70 to, let's say, 700 yards, this is bloody murder. And you see this uh, uh, in pictures uh, where the lines have come this close and they're blazing away. And it, it is horrific. Um, it, it has led me to believe that our technical arrangements change so quickly we can't adapt to them. Uh, today I'd say apps. I certainly haven't adapted to half of <laughs> what's going on with apps. And we don't quite know where it's taking us. You know, we're becoming antisocial. We're all talking to machines. What's happening? Um, these guys, many of these regular officers, couldn't adapt, and they didn't trust their man's um, marksmanship, so they just kept marching them up, shoulder to shoulder, and ba-boom. Those huge casualties, and then you had the effective artillery. In the museum, you can see a canister, lead balls put in a can, fired from a smooth bore. Napoleon spread out like a giant shotgun. You can knock down you know, a whole company with one round. Men went mad. Um, they said after Antietam that many men were never the same. And what you would have after a battle is men ro roaming about stunned. They were stunned for days. They could barely function. And this led to dysentery, diarrhea. Uh, medieval people may have been right that the emotions are seated in the bowels because if you get frightened, ter terrified, that's what happens. Uh, you soil yourself. Uh, one Union colonel after Antietam wandered away and was missing for six weeks. He had simply closed down. It's called dissociation. Um, they didn't have, the Victorians didn't have this kind of psychological vocabulary. They simply said, you'd lost your character. It was kind of a moral judgment on you, you know. You'd, you'd let the team down. Uh, today, I hope we're a little more sympathetic to the fact that nobody can stand this kind of thing indefinitely. So you have dissociation. We talk a lot today about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Y you had that in the Civil War. You had combat exhaustion, where soldiers couldn't take it. And all the armies in their rear were followed by clouds of stragglers. That is men who could no longer face the firing line. They'd stay with the army. Uh, they didn't want to be taken in for desertion because that was often a short road to a firing squad. But they couldn't face it. And often they were called coffee coolers because when troops had to move quickly, they had to take their coffee boiling. Uh, but coffee coolers, stragglers sat around and drank their coffee. But they'd lost their character, as they called it. And after the war, many of these damaged men formed herds of tramps wandering America. There was an infestation of tramps on the roads, the men who shattered, uh, just as we, after Vietnam, had homeless veterans on our streets. And we have traumatic brain injury, what we're looking at now with the IEDs in Afghanistan, Iraq, the NFL looking at traumatic brain injury, the concussion of the shells damaged many of them mentally. Uh, the Civil War battlefield was uh, horrific with sound from the guns, the rattle of the musketry. So why does it get any worse in 1864? Well, for one thing, it, this is war has been going on a long time. Uh, you know, we, we have officers who've been serving, for example, throughout the war and they are getting uh, threadbare. But also, due to 
Ulysses S. Grant's concept of the war in 1864, we're fighting more continuously, aren't we? Uh, many of you know this as well, if not better than I do. Uh, I suspect many of you in this audience are pretty expert on the war. Um, just to give an example of how fierce it was in 1864 in the wilderness, May 5 through 7, fighting between Lee and Grant, two th th those three days, May 5 to 7, the North suffered 18,400 casualties, the South 11,400. And y you would expect that they would pull back, look their, lick their wounds for a while, but they don't. Grant sidesteps and moves forward, sidesteps and moves forward. By June the 12th, after one month of fighting, Grant had lost 50,000 men, Lee 30,000. These, these are staggering numbers that are being endured. And it gets to a point where officers cannot get the men to go forward. They're just too beaten to deal with this. So this is what Holmes is talking about. It is a, an intense fighting that is getting even worse by 1864. And then there's another element we have to throw in to this psychological puzzle that we're seeing as the war moves into harder and harder phases. That there's something we call war psychosis. And that is you, as a war goes on and lengthens and lengthens, you get really angry at the enemy who you hold responsible for this. Um, you are less willing perhaps to give quarter, to take prisoners. You're more willing to burn down buildings, barns and so on. You're getting very angry. We see this in World War II, say, on the Eastern Front between the Russians and the Germans who slaughter each other with zeal. Uh, we see it perhaps in the Pacific where towards the end the Japanese are launching uh, suicide charges and our soldiers are just mowing them down. They're not taking any prisoners. You see it in the air war where, say, the British Royal Air Force Bomber Command paid the Germans back for bombing British cities a hundredfold. They just leveled German cities, just leveled them. And there is an element of rage here, uh, of anger at these people who have made so much misery. Sherman's a bit of an example. When he was teaching at a Louisiana Academy on the eve of war, uh, he loved his cadets. He wept when he left. By 1864, this is another Sherman. He is a man who's waging hard war, they called it, hard war. And we're moving towards something approximating total war. Uh, not as bad, perhaps, as at the end of World War II, where the Russians, for example, as they advance into Germany, just commit horrific war crimes. But it is a cruel war. The Northern High Command comes to believe that to defeat the South must break the will of the population that is supporting the troops. Remember we said the nation by this time is uh, an almost organic uh, entity you send the boys from every village and town, and they go off with the girls waving. And it's not just that small professional army, it's a people's army. So Sherman, Grant, Sheridan say, okay, what we've got to do then is not only defeat the rebels in the field, we've got to break the base that is supporting them, that keeps them in the field. And so, for example, in Sherman's March, there's a great deal of destruction of civilian property. Many civilians are made refugees, and we think, oh, well, refugees. Uh, many people starve or die of exposure uh, due to this. Uh, we're here at, at Gettysburg. We're close to, relatively close to the Shenandoah, which in 1864, Hunter and Sheridan but clear out. They burn it out. And it gets even uglier on the fringes. 
uh, the Northern Army is ad advanced, for example. They do commit abuses. We do have rape. Uh, we do have uh, seemingly at times needless brutalization of civilians. They have heart attacks, miscarriages because of the fear of what is happening uh, during the invasion. And partisan rangers, guerrillas strike back in Virginia, John Singleton Mosby, uh, most famous of these rangers, hits back in ambushing these advancing Union forces, and then they slip back into the crowd. They take their uniforms off and go home till the next time. And this, in its turn, angers the Union soldiers. Dirty bushwhackers, they call them. And if they get them, they don't get a trial. And they don't get to go to a POW camp. They're killed. So then Mosby gets permission from Lee to do the same. And what we have is an escalation of that anger. And it's also provoked by the fact that basic values are at stake. And people feel that the enemy is trying to destroy their whole way of life. In the North, it's that the South is trying to destroy this wonderful experiment in Republican or even Democratic government. The dirty rebels are trying to wreck the hope of mankind. In the South, it's that you're trying to incite race war when the North goes to recruiting black soldiers, which is an absolutely sensible manpower thing for the Union government to do, it puts a whole new set of very enthused men into Union blue. They want to fight this war. It's for their people. But to the Southerners, this is an incitement to mayhem to race war. Hence, as many of you again know very well, when black soldiers and their officers are captured, they often do not get to go to the rear. And we have instance after instance where uh, they, they shoot the black soldiers they've captured out of hand, and then they line the officers up and shoot them. And of course, there is retaliation. The Lincoln government says, you keep doing this, I'm going to take your POWs, and I'll shoot them. And in the field, the soldiers say, you know, don't take prisoners when this happens. Uh, one of the North's battle cries is, remember Fort Pillow, after black soldiers at Fort Pillow were not allowed to surrender. So what you see in 1864 is an enormous movement towards total war. Um, we are fighting the kind of uh, battles with enormous casualties that foreshadow World War I. We are making war on civilians. Uh, one South Carolina woman said to a Union officer, why are you making war on us? We're combatant, non-combatants. He said, no. You support this war. We're making war on you. And this was the reality for many people. And just mentioned, too, civilians did go insane. When the war swept through their townships, it was horrifying. Civilians, citizens of Gettysburg, went insane. Uh, can we imagine this three-day battle suddenly taking place in a small town? There's a wonderful uh, blown-up photograph in the center of Gettysburg as it looked right before the battle. And, uh, it, you know, it's a sleepy little market town. Uh, suddenly, you've got these huge armies and 20-odd thousand casualties in three days. And they're in your front yard. They're in your rhubarb patch. They've been stuffed down your well. 
in that July heat or the heat uh, of really any battle in, in the main fighting season, they couldn't get the bodies underground fast enough. So they end up shoving them under porches in compost heaps. Uh, you might find when you came back, if you'd been fortunate enough as a civilian to get away for a while to avoid the fighting, that your ice house was stacked with corpses. Uh, they, they just didn't know what to do with them. And so it's not only soldiers who are pushed to the edge of sanity by these terrible confrontations. It is civilians. Um, and they lose their minds because of the deprivation they go through. Um, I worked in Kentucky, and one of the big uh, things that the armies looked for in Kentucky was horses. And the two sides between them, looking for cavalry, destroyed for a while the horse farming industry in Kentucky. And we have um, descriptions of the heads of these horse farms are going insane. Uh, one at least committed suicide. He lost everything to the two armies. They just took his horses and, and destroyed his livelihood. Um, Kentucky in 1860 was in the top ten states of the Union by per capita income since 1870 or this 1870 census, it's been in the bottom 10. And I can guarantee you, having worked there uh, most of my adult career, uh, it hurts. We didn't have the money we needed often in higher education. So it still carries on. But it, it was a hard war for civilians. and. Uh, I've become particularly conscious, uh, working on this book, of the dilemma faced by black Americans, the slaves in the South. Uh, sure, OK, it was great a Union army was advancing. It was coming here to uh, potentially free you. But could you guarantee it? Uh, there were many racists in the Union Army, uh, and they would treat the freedmen, as they were called, very badly. And if they could get work often uh, with the Union Armors, it was the worst kind of work. And some of the women who fled had to sell themselves for food uh, to the Union soldiers. So you had a dilemma. Do I run? Do I stay? And if I run, can I get there? Uh, one Union uh, captain describes uh, a black girl with her baby coming into his lines, and she's been savaged by dogs. Uh, they haven't stopped her, but she's badly uh, shredded in the legs. And um, Some quite startling cases where, as the Union soldiers come through, uh, the blacks will tell them that's where they hid the family silver or the horses are down in that hollow, you want to go get them. Aha! If you stay there, you're likely to be hanged when the blue coats move on. So it, it's a dilemma, and Susan Walker um, was, if you like, a missionary who went to the Sea Islands to establish schools for the freed African-American population. And one of the freed slaves, a very nice young lady, said to her, we don't know of you alls who to trust. Um, you know, union recruiting parties would come through uh, those liberated areas like the, uh, the rice plantations of the Sea Islands, and they'd just take every black male of military age. Um, and induct them. Lincoln tried to stop it, but, but this sort of thing went on. So, you know, there were reasons why in 1864 many, many people were suffering. Now, obviously, for um, the North, 1865 is a much better year. 
Uh, of course, for all those who are grieving for their lost relatives, it's, it's still tough. Uh, and for those who are coming home maimed, either physically or mentally. But the Union has been preserved. Slavery is abolished. For the South, 1865 is perhaps even a blacker year, a darker year. Anyway, I haven't been flagged that, that I need to go to questioning, but I think I might do that in just one second. Um, I'd just like to read one passage from a, a Southern girl to show how painful um, those casualties were. And, and this girl was Sarah Morgan. Uh, if you get a chance to read her, I really hope you do. Um, got a little flag here if I get the right one. Sarah Morgan was a young girl from Louisiana. On February the 5th of 1864, she recorded that her brother Gibbs had been reported uh, killed in action. She would not believe it at first. Quote, not dead, not dead. Oh my God, Gibbs is not dead. By the end of that week, she's accepted that Gibbs is dead. And then just six days later, on February the 11th, she wrote of her other brother. Oh God, oh God have mercy on us. George is dead. Both in a week. George, our sole hope, our sole dependence. They had both been killed in the same action. And that uh, loss was terrible emotionally and of course in an age when most people worked physically farm or factory the loss of those two young men not only meant a long emotional deprivation it meant that that family was in trouble as to how they would earn their daily bread so it, it does carry on for a long, long time. Um, there's a lovely little anecdote that I, I just came across when I was teaching military history and, and set uh, Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders, his memoir of the uh, campaign in Cuba in 1898. And what I found there is a remarkable little anecdote about civilian loss. Um, the Rough Riders, or the 1st Volunteer Cavalry, trained in the West. I have a lousy member memory for a historian. Gotcha. Um, but it um, was Wyoming, I think, and then they came down through Texas uh, to Florida to embark for Cuba. And as the train came through, uh, Roosevelt would stand on the observation platform. They came through Confederate territory. And the war was sufficiently behind America now that the, the old Confederate veterans would come down and salute as the train went by. Young boys wished they were going to. Another great adventure. Young girls begged souvenirs, buttons, clip off a uniform. The old ladies also stood by the railway tracks, but they didn't say a word. They had absorbed so much loss that they could not emote. That's a fascinating anecdote. They stood there silent. I would like to hear you. I've blathered on, and uh, I hope I haven't depressed you too much. <laughs> One of our sons read this and said they got the cover wrong. It's not the feel-good book of the summer. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh, they, they wounded, yes. That's a good question, a very good question. Um, most communities in the North and South did form relief societies, uh, exactly as you say. They provided what relief they could to widows and orphans. Um, they would help buy prosthetic limbs, which became for many states after the war the major part of their budget for a few years, providing uh, artificial limbs. Um, unfortunately, uh, in the South, obviously, uh, with the end of the war, Confederate currency is worthless. Uh, the South is in very dire straits. It's very hard to keep this up um, and get no relief from the federal government. In the North, uh, it's, it's arguably a much better situation. And, of course, the Grand Army of the Republic, the Veterans Organization, is a very skillful lobbying group for pensions and other support. Many did not get support. They didn't know it was available, uh, or they were too proud to apply for it, or the bureaucracy just didn't help them. But there were efforts in both sections to help. What I did find, though, a lot of pioneering sociological work on the war was done in the 1920s uh, after World War I, and people were looking at a lot of you know, damage from that. And they went back to the Civil War and found that the penitentiary population in North and South, which in 1860 had been primarily male, by 1863 is primarily female and child. And what's happened is that um, widows and orphans who have not got the kind of relief you are talking about have been picked up as vagrants and they are, they're guilty of no other crime but they are being put in the penitentiary because they cannot support themselves so it's a great question so oh great oh I was supposed to repeat the question sorry in your study did you um find an increase in insane asylums mm -hmm. from all of this? Yes. Another great question. And the answer is yes. Um, the question for those of you who might not have heard it is, uh, do we see an increase in insane asylums as a result of this? And the answer is yes. Um, and also, there were people committed to penitentiaries uh, if they were violent. We do see uh, combat damage veterans who are violent and I am increasingly thinking that quite a number of these men have uh, TBI as it's now called traumatic brain injury uh, from the concussion of the shells they have been through and I didn't mention but meant to in my talk that um, part again the what makes uh, 1864 so tough is trench warfare where the soldier has to if it be it in front of Atlanta or Petersburg Virginia has to tolerate mortar rounds or shells falling on him or sniper fire and he can't fight back and in World War One this this created great uh, emotional trauma and physical trauma because these mortar bombs and so on exploding create enormous concussion so uh, Quite a few thousand men don't recover, and if they become really violent, they are committed. Um, now, I have to say, I think the medical profession is, generally speaking at this time, unsympathetic. Um, I do my own little reenactments in the book, though they're with the people who did this. But I, I do, I've got to an age where it doesn't matter if I, you know, what I do really. Um, uh, I'm free now. Uh, so I um, have little reenactments. Uh, and in one, we take a uh, brisk walk down a neurasthenia ward with Weir Mitchell, probably the ne leading neurologist in the United States. And uh, I use his case histories to have a conversation with him. And he tells us, now, this is private so-and-so. Uh, he was hit in the arm at Fredericksburg, and it's frozen across his body, and we have to shoot him with morphine, wrap him in 
uh, opium plasters, drip water on his arm, uh, and in some cases that they do commit suicide. So Weir Mitchell is very sympathetic to soldiers who have nerve injuries from physical wounds. However, when Weir Mitchell cannot see a wound, if it's in here, he just simply says, you're a coward, you're malingering. There's not a great deal of sympathy. And I'm sorry to say, I suspect that there are still uh, in armed forces, not just ours, but elsewhere, uh, some people who take that approach, you know, if, if, if some veteran says, you know, can you treat me for post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, in most cases, we are sympathetic today. But some service people still say they've been made uncomfortable because of an insinuation that this is cowardly. And that is unfortunate because these are legitimate mental wounds. Yes, sir. Only one. You talked about how much rage yes. there was in 1864. Is there a point in time when uh, that became less so? When that be, mm -hmm. uh, and if so, why? How long did it take for that rage to yes. begin to dissipate? That, that's another great question, um, super questions. The question is, um, we, we have this growing rage in 1864, and if I understand you correctly, uh, we want to know how long does it take to dissipate. Um, it's a very good question. I would say by the mid-1880s, or even earlier, by, by uh, 1880, uh, we're beginning to see a dissolving of that. Um, particularly in the North, because the North can afford to be generous. Um, when I first came to Gettysburg in 1964, um, one of the souvenirs they were selling was two little cast metal men. And, and one was a little uh, Union veteran, and he was saying, hey, why not forget it? And the other was a little rebel veteran, and he was saying, forget hell. So. There is that bitterness in the South. You, you came in here, you destroyed so much. Um, you burned cities, and we won't forgive you. And, you know, we were trying to establish our independence, just like the revolution. Uh, you tyrannized us. But they do come together. Uh, by 1898, there is so much reconciliation between white North and South um, that uh, Joseph Wheeler, the famous rebel cavalry officer, is made uh, commander of the U U.S. cavalry in Cuba. Now, the negative side of that is it's a kind of white people coming together to shut out black people. As you know, emancipation uh, comes with the war and um, uh, the, the right to vote for black males. And there is a concerted effort, to be honest, behind some of the white reconciliation of North and South to shove African Americans black back down. Um, often at uh, reunions, uh, black veterans are not invited. Uh, even the Shaw Monument, you know, that famous one in Boston that comes in at the end of glory, that beautiful St. Gaudens memorial. Um, when that was put up, I think, uh, Boyle Street in Boston or wherever, um, the names of the officers who fell were put on the monument, but not the uh, enlisted men. So it takes a bit longer there. But it's a great question, and, and, and I think it won't be me, but I'd love to see somebody do work on this. Uh, how long does it take to dissipate? The, the same thing after World War II. I mean, our um, war with the Japanese on both sides was ferocious, and yet very quickly we're rebuilding Japan. Same with Germany. Yeah. So it, it does seem to dissipate very quickly. Though with some veterans, I mean, you can still today 
talk to veterans of the Pacific War who have never forgiven the Japanese and uh, will die without forgiving them. But thank you. And thank you all for being here.